Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. And I'm not sure if you're going to be able to hear this, but this morning I woke up feeling a little bit under the weather. A bit chesty, a bit throaty, a bit congested. But by no means unwell enough to not carry on with what I wanted to talk about with you all today because, unbelievably, somehow it's nearly December already. And despite the sense of profound shock that I feel that that month has come around just so fast, I do think that it's good for us to all get into the spirit of things. And so as I am determined to feel both festive and maybe a little frisky, despite feeling a tad unwell, I think it's only right for us to look into the what, when, how and why of the times when the River Thames froze over. But before we take a look at today's topic, I want to say an absolutely massive thank you to History Hit for sponsoring another video on this channel. History Hit brings you the stories that shaped the world through their award-winning podcast network and online history channel. It's like Netflix, but all history. With History Hit, you can watch hundreds of hours of original history documentaries anywhere, anytime, on any device. Brought to you by expert historians such as Dan Snow, Professor Susanna Lipscomb, Dan Jones, and more. In addition to already having hundreds of expert-led programmes, they add two more every week. History Hit also launch 19 new episodes weekly across eight podcasts, which includes the world's leading history podcast, Dan Snow's History Hit. This week, I have been fascinated by this programme, Exploring the Medieval Afterlife with Eleanor Yaniger. In it, she explores how ghost stories permeated society throughout history and across geographies, and in doing so, attempts to gain a better understanding of the concerns of the people that told these tales. Click the link in my description box to find out more and to subscribe to History Hit. As an added bonus, this month, History Hit are running a very special offer. Use code BLACKFRIDAY at checkout to get 50% off your first six months of subscription. Thanks again to History Hit for sponsoring this video. Today, we're going to take a look at the Frost Fairs. Anyone who is familiar with Game of Thrones, I'm sure that the phrase winter is coming will be a fairly well known one. I believe it's also going to become a knowledge that George R. R. Martin took inspiration from various events in medieval and early modern history. Indeed, it has been suggested that the nearly choric repetition of this phrase winter is coming might in fact be a reference to a particular period of time one that has come to be known as the Little Ice Age. Indeed, when we try to explain the reason why the Thames used to once freeze, and equally, why portraits frequently depict people in thick wools, damasks and furs, the Little Ice Age is frequently going to be one of the first ports of call people turn to for an explanation. An awareness of the existence of this climate event has been around for decades, and down the years, evidence to support its existence, show its spread, and explain how it happened, has grown exponentially. In The Little Ice Age, Brian Fagan writes that, A generation ago, we had a generalised impression of Little Ice Age climate, compiled with painstaking care from a bewildering array of historical sources and handful of tree ring sequences. Today, and for context, this book was first published in 2000, before being republished with a new afterword in 2019. Today, the scatter of tree ring records has become hundreds, from throughout the Northern Hemisphere and many from south of the equator too, amplified with a growing body of temperature data from ice cores, drilled in Antarctica, Greenland, the Peruvian Andes, and other locations. In recent years, evidence has started to be compiled that is beginning to challenge the idea 
that the Little Ice Age was some kind of fully global event. Instead, there is significant evidence to point to the fact that there was warming in some locations during a period of expected cooling, and equally evidence of cooling in locations where there is supposed to have been warming. Additionally, substantial work has also been done to look at what might have preceded this period of lowered temperature, and what was found was a period of warmer temperature. This period of warmer temperature has come to be known as the medieval warm period. It has been suggested that increased volcanic activity at the end of this period was what kicked off the lowering of the temperature across large parts of the world, although, as I have just mentioned, seemingly not across all of it. The uptick in this volcanic activity is thought likely to have commenced with the massive eruption of the Samalus volcano in 1257. This is thought to have generated a cold snap. According to reports, the Samalus eruption resulted in double the amount of sulphur deposits being subsequently found in ice cores in relation to this eruption than have been found in connection to the 1815 Tambora eruption. Now, I am going to leave a link to my video on the creation of Frankenstein for those who may be interested in the suggested effects of this 1815 eruption. But for quick context, 1816, which is the year after the eruption, has come to be referred to as the year without a summer, due to the climate shift, the drop in temperature that occurred at this time, presumably as a result of this volcanic activity. And thus, I think the logical inference is that the 1257 eruption would likely have had a similar effect. Certainly, it has been suggested that the Little Ice Age itself began in around 1300. However, not everyone agrees with this, and earlier this year, researchers from the University of Massachusetts Amherst released some findings, which may possibly push the start of the Little Ice Age to the late 1300s or even the early 1400s. They explain that their investigations have shown that the Little Ice Age, quote, was preceded by an exceptional intrusion of warm Atlantic water into the Nordic seas in the late 1300s. The intrusion was a consequence of persistent atmospheric blocking over the North Atlantic, linked to unusually high solar activity. The warmer water led to the breakup of sea ice and carving of tidewater glaciers. Weakening of the blocking anomaly in the late 1300s allowed the large volume of ice that had accumulated to be exported into the North Atlantic. This led to a weakening of the subpolar gyre, setting the stage for the subsequent Little Ice Age. I'm sure that the discussions regarding the causes, date range and spread of the Little Ice Age is nowhere near being at an end, and neither are the conversations about the potential for these climate shifts to have an influence over events in our history. There are those, for example, Brian Fagan included, who have chosen to place the timelines of shifting temperatures alongside timelines of key historical events. And through doing so, for some individuals, there are connections that are being made between the medieval warm period and improved crop yields in northwestern Europe, the Norse settlement of Greenland, the Norman conquest of England, the cathedral building boom the Crusades into the Holy Land, the Mongol invasions, and the rise of the Hanseatic League. Fagan is also one who has dated the start of the Little Ice Age to around 1300, offering a proposed end date for the Little Ice Age of around 1850. And he also points out that within this date range, there are events that occurred which could, I would say conceivably, be linked to a prolonged period of cooling in the temperature of certain regions. Within the first century of this period alone, there was the Great Famine, the Hundred Years' War, Black Death, and the abandonment of the Norse settlement of Greenland. It is important to note that Fagin does not claim that, quote, climate drove history in a direct and causative way to the point of toppling governments. However, he does also point out, quite reasonably, I'd say, 
that it is not possible to argue that, quote, climate change is something you can totally ignore. And so we come to the freezing of the Thames, and eventually to the frost fairs, all of which happened during this little ice age, with the frost fairs occurring as the temperatures began to drop even further. And isn't this just the neatest explanation? It was so cold that the brackish tidal waters of the Thames, the ones that we know, were able to freeze solid enough and for long enough that people could travel in horse-drawn sleds upon it. And that's in addition to them being able to build kiosks to sell food and other wares on it, put on puppet shows, set up pens or areas to host blood sports and gambling. And that is just to name a few of the activities that took place on the frozen waters of the Thames. One of my favourite phrases, it's one that I frequently repeat to myself as a vital reminder, correlation is not causation. Perhaps then, when it comes to looking at the frost fairs and how they correlate with the Little Ice Age, this period of cold should, I think, most properly be referred to as part of the causation. Part of the reason why the Thames was able to freeze solid enough for long enough for the frost fairs to be set up. But the cold is almost certainly not the sole reason why this is able to happen. We should, for example, consider how different the River Thames actually was during the Little Ice Age compared with what we know it as today. For centuries, the River Thames was a major way to transport goods and people. It was also known to be wider and shallower than it is today. We know that large and small boats travelled along its length and from bank to bank. The banks themselves were littered with points for boats to launch and land. The sheer weight of human traffic and trade cargo, I would say, is likely something that's going to add to the shallowness of the river because things are going to fall or be thrown overboard. Additionally, as this engraving by Wenceslas Holler shows, the old London Bridge crossed the river on top of a series of narrow archways whose feet had been built onto piers. And when this is looked at in conjunction with all the other factors that we have just discussed, together they all serve to slow the river down. With the temperatures in London dropping by as much as 2 degrees Celsius, which is 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit, the scene was set for the Thames to freeze over solidly on numerous occasions during the Little Ice Age. Indeed, in the late 16th to early 17th century, John Stowe was working on his various texts, his annal and chronicles. In them, he reported that from the 25th of December 1434 to the 10th of February 1435, the Thames froze below London Bridge all the way to Gravesend. In 1506, according to the Chronicles of Greyfriars of London, there was, quote, such a sore snow and a frost that men might go with carts and horses over the Thames. Carts crossed the ice between Lambeth and Westminster in 1515 too. Raphael Hollinshead's chronicle reported that on New Year's Eve, as 1564 turned into 1565, quote, people went over and alongst the Thames on the ice from London Bridge to Westminster. Some played at the football as boldly there as if it had been on the dry land. Diverse of the court, being then at Westminster, shot daily at pricks, that's archery, set upon the Thames. And the people, both men and women, went on the Thames in greater numbers than in any street of the City of London. By tradition, and those are weasel words indeed, Queen Elizabeth I walked on the frozen Thames at this time too. In 1608, the Thames froze for six weeks. Edmund Howes, writing in his Continuation of the Abridgment of Stowe's English Chronicle, which was published in 1611, explained that the frost set in on the 8th of December 1607 and, in consequence, the Thames froze. He went on to state that, quote, From Sunday the 10th of January 1608 until the 15th of the same the frost grew so extreme as the ice became firm and removed not, and then all sorts of men, women and children went boldly upon the ice in most parts. 
Some shot at pricks, which, as I mentioned previously, means archery. Others bowled and danced, with other variable pastimes. By reason of which concourse of people were many that set up booths and standings upon the ice, as fruit sellers, victuallers that sold beer and wine, shoemakers and a barber's tent, etc. Quite incredibly, I think, it is also stated that the tents that had been erected on the ice had fires roaring within them. These festivities were memorialised in this pamphlet, which is also from 1608 and is entitled The Great Frost, Cold Doings in London, Except It Be at the Lottery, with news out of the country. A familiar talk between a countryman and a citizen touching this terrible frost and the Great Lottery and the effects of them. Perhaps, though, the best-known frost fair to take place on the Thames occurred during the period when the Thames froze from the beginning of December 1683 to the 5th of February 1684, when we are told that the cold, quote, congealed the River Thames to that degree that another city, as it were, was erected thereon where, by the great number of streets and shops with their rich furniture, it represented a great fair, with a variety of carriages and diversions of all sorts. And near Whitehall, a whole ox was roasted on the ice. John Evelyn's diary entry for the 24th of January 1684 reads as follows, quote, The frost continues more and more severe. The Thames before London was still planted with booths in formal streets, all sorts of trades and shops furnished and full of commodities, even to a printing press, where the people and ladies took a fancy to have their names printed and the day and year set down when printed on the Thames. This humour took so universally that it was estimated that the printer gained £5 a day, that's around £600 in today's money, for printing a line only at sixpence a name, besides what he got by ballads, etc. Coaches plied from Westminster to the Temple and from several other stairs to and fro, as in the streets. Sleds, sliding with skates, a bull baiting, horse and coach races, puppet placed interludes, cooks, tippling and other lewd places so that it seemed to be a bacchanalian triumph or carnival on the water, while it was a severe judgment on the land. The trees not only splitting as if the lightning struck, but men and cattle perishing in diverse places, and the very seas so locked up with ice that no vessels could stir out or come in. The fowls, fish and birds, and all our exotic plants and greens universally perishing. Many parks of deer were destroyed, and all sorts of fuel so dear that there were great contributions to preserve the poor alive. Nor was this severe weather much less intense in most parts of Europe, even as far as Spain and the most southern tracts. A London, by reason of the excessive coldness of the air, hindering the ascent of the smoke, was so filled with the fuliginous steam of the sea coal that hardly could one see across the street. And this, filling the lungs with its gross particles, exceedingly obstructed the breast, so as one could scarcely breathe. Here was no water to be had from the pipes and engines, nor could the brewers and diverse other tradesmen work, and every moment was full of disastrous accidents. Unsurprisingly then, these bouts of freezing weather caused chaos for those who were not at liberty to simply disport themselves or indeed earn their livings on the frozen Thames. But equally, for those who were on the ice, their fun and or money-making was on an unknown clock. Stay too long in the hopes of finding more fun or trade and you would risk literally everything because all it takes is a slight, likely imperceptible rise in the temperature, and that's going to bring the thaw. Wares could be lost, but so too could people. Drowning or death from hypothermia could be the fatal consequence of staying on the frozen river for too long. And according to reports, this certainly would be the fate for some. A week after John Evelyn recorded these thoughts and experiences, 
on the 31st of January 1684, it seems that King Charles II, his wife Queen Catherine, his brother James Duke of York, later James II, James's second wife Mary of Modena, and James's second daughter Anne, later Queen Anne, and Anne's husband George were all on the ice together. Among other japes, it seems, the royal party paid a visit to the print shop of one G. Croom on the ice, and there they had their names printed on a little slip of paper. These seem to have been souvenir tickets, personalised mementos of a trip to the Frost Fair. More Frost Fairs would take place on the Thames in the 18th and early 19th centuries, and they too would be memorialised with similar keepsakes like this woodcut, which provides a view of the Thames Frost Fair of 1715-1716. Below this image is the following verse. Behold the liquid Thames frozen o'er, that lately ships of mighty burthen bore. The watermen, for want of rowing boats, make use of booths to get their pence and groats. Here you may print your name, though cannot write, cause numbed with cold, "'Tis done with great delight, and lay it by that ages yet to come "'may see what things upon the ice were done.'" These lines may be familiar to you if you have happened to walk beneath Southwark Bridge on its south side, because this poem is the one that appears on the panels there. The woodcut we can see is also labelled to detail the events being shown. We can see that there was nine-pin bowling, Cripple Atkins roasting an ox, boys sliding, a printing booth. And I have to wonder, was it the one that would put your name and the date of your visit on this sheet, in that lozenge that's right in the middle, down at the bottom? We see there was a music booth, a shoulder of mutton roasting in a string at the sign of the rat in a cage, a tavern, a rolling press, a Geneva booth which would sell gin, a gingerbread stall, a goldsmith, Huffing Jack, and one Will Ellis and his wife, who seem to have been a pair of poets, because we are told they could be found rhyming on the hard frost. And so once again I'm given cause to wonder, could it be that Will Ellis and his wife are responsible for the little rhyming verse that features in the bottom left-hand corner of this page? Keepsakes like these continued to be printed and sold on the frozen Thames, up to and including the period that played host to the last Frost Fair of 1814. At this time, there had been freezing temperatures between the 27th of December 1813 and the 7th of February 1814. We are told that the stalls of this Frost Fair began to be set out between the 25th of January and the 1st of February. 1814. On the 5th of February 1814, one S. Warner printed this souvenir for someone who clearly wished to commemorate their trip to the ice. In addition to memorialising the date, the paper reads as follows. Notice, whereas you, J. Frost, so that's I'm assuming Jack Frost, have by force and violence taken possession of the River Thames, I hereby give you warning to quit immediately, and it's signed A. Thor. It seems that this notice would have the desired effect because sure enough, the ice began to break up on the very same day, the 5th of February, 1814. And very sadly, it is reported that several people would die as a result of this particular thaw. Going forward, the climate was becoming milder and warmer, and then, eventually, London Bridge itself was replaced in 1831. As we can see, this new bridge would cross the river using fewer, wider archways. The new bridge allowed the river to speed up, and as I've just mentioned, at the same time, the climate was getting milder and warmer. These factors would combine to ensure that never again would the River Thames freeze sufficiently to allow it to play host to another frost fair. So what do you think of the frost fairs? Of our potentially contested understanding of how these events came to pass? Do you think we'll ever be able to get irrefutable answers for moments like this in history? And if we were able to, if it happened, 
might that actually go some way to spoiling the fun of looking into history in the first place? As always, I'm looking forward to reading your conversations in the comments section underneath this video, or you can find me elsewhere on social media. I will leave links to all the other places you can find me on the internet in my description box, so do consider following me over on some or all of them so that we can continue this conversation and start some others. I do hope you enjoyed this video and found it useful, and if you did, please do share it with your friends. Please also let me know you liked it by hitting the thumbs up and please subscribe to the channel. If you think you are subscribed, now is an ideal time just to have a little check, make sure that YouTube hasn't mysteriously unsubscribed you against your will. And what's even better is that while you are there, checking, subscribing, maybe resubscribing, you can hit the bell icon that sits beside the subscribe button and then select all in the drop down that will appear. And that will mean, allegedly, that YouTube will tell you when I've next uploaded. I hope you can have a great day, whatever you're doing and I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.